ravaging the East since 1937 and Japan's invasion of China, reached Europe on the 1st of September 1939 with Germany's invasion of Poland. It became global on the 7th of December 1941 when Japanese aircraft attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. It touched every continent and lasted for six years. It ended with a new weapon for a new age. This is the history of the greatest of all man-made events. These men are part of that history. They are eyewitnesses to the triumphs and tragedies of the war wherever it was fought. Their testimony is part of the story of how our world was made. those who could pay and those who could no longer meet. The price of empire. The military fights wars. But wars are made by political leaders and they fight with words. During 1943, the leaders fired off countless words. After Stalingrad, Midway and Guadalcanal, El Alamein and the torch landings, the leaders of the Grand Coalition, as Churchill dubbed it, the United Nations, as Roosevelt called them, planned how best to secure victory and how to arrange the post-war world at conference after conference. Because they talked, the Allies, as commentators have noted, fought one war on two fronts. Axis powers fought two wars, Germany in Europe and Japan in Asia. For both of them, 1943 would be, in many ways, the beginning of the end. The first conference of 1943, codenamed Symbol, was held in Casablanca in French Morocco in January. Churchill, Roosevelt and the leaders of the Free French met to plan their European strategy for the next phase of the war. Joseph Stalin, citing the ongoing conflict in Stalingrad as his reason, declined to attend. They discussed our offensive strategy for this year in which it's intended to hit the enemy's smashing blows on new fronts. President Roosevelt delivered the most provocative statement. At the conference's close, he said, possibly without consulting his allies, the elimination of German, Japanese and Italian war power means the unconditional surrender of Germany, Japan and Italy. Once out of the box, it was something that could not be put back. There would be no armistice, no truce, no compromise. Germany and Japan learned that one can start a war, but it takes two to make peace. A Washington conference codenamed Trident followed in May. The Beck conference, Quadrant, was held in August. Sextant, the Cairo conference in November, outlined the Allied position against Japan. It was attended by Roosevelt, Churchill and Chiang Kai-shek. Stalin did not attend. Chiang Kai-shek was Japan's bitter enemy and Stalin was not prepared to risk offending the Japanese and perhaps stirring them into attacking his eastern border by sitting at the same table as the Chinese leader. Two days after Cairo, with Chang safely back in China, Stalin met Roosevelt and Churchill for the Tehran Conference, the first meeting between the big three. Stalin received a commitment to opening a second front. 
but where? Churchill favoured the Balkan or Aegean options, but the locus of power had shifted and Roosevelt opened proceedings by outlining the Normandy invasion plan, blindsiding Churchill and demonstrating that the Grand Coalition had become the big two who would dominate the post-war years. A terrific conference, planning to make certain of the destruction of the German forces in the shortest possible time. And these are some of the men carrying responsibility for that most desirable objective. Japan was also concerned to draw together its partners for a show of unity. Prime Minister Tojo convened the Greater East Asia Conference, attended by Shang Jinhui, Prime Minister of Manchukuo, Wang Qingwei, head of the reorganized national government of China, Ba Moore from Burma, Subhas Chandra Bose from India, Jose Laurel from the Philippines, and Prince Juan Watayakon from Thailand. Not many were convinced. As early as 1936, the Chinese political activist Du Yuan had written, Pan-Asianism is Japanese imperialism, nothing more, nothing less. Through these 12 months of conferencing, the war on the battlefields had been developing decisively. American troops first went into action with Operation Torch in North Africa, where the Axis was reinforcing Tunis from the sea. General Jürgen von Arnim commanded the German forces Erwin Rommel's Panzer Army Africa, withdrawing through Tripolitania, was moving to join him, and overall command passed to General Vittorio Ambrosio. At the beginning of February, the Germans launched offensives. Von Arnim's called Spring Wind turned back and cut off American forces around Sidi Bou Sid. Rommel, his operation was called Morning Wind, seized Gafsa. The American troops were battle ready. They had been through basic training. Basic training is a brutal thing. Six weeks of basic training, you're ready to kill your best friend. Every morning, it was very simple. You got up and you were told this, kill or be killed, every single day. Battle ready was not battle hardened. They were raw recruits who got their noses bloodied as Rommel and von Arnim pressed ahead. Rommel was making for the Kasserine Pass, a three kilometer wide gap in the Atlas Mountains. February the 19th, he seized the pass. Its American defenders withdrew in disorderly fashion. Rommel lacked the support he needed, von Arnim hanging on to his heavy armor. The Allies quickly reformed and reorganized. By the 20th, Rommel had been held. By the 24th, the Allies were starting to claw back the Axis gains. Their forward momentum could not be halted from this point. Gafsel was retaken by Patton, the New Zealand Corps broke through the Tebega Gap and the final assault on Tunis began on May the 6th. It fell a day later and General Alexander, commanding 18th Army Group, signaled Churchill, we are masters of the North African shore. Mastery had come at a cost. There were 75,000 Allied casualties, 300,000 on the Axis side, of whom 240,000 were prisoners. It was a setback for Hitler, for Mussolini, for whom support had collapsed because of losses on the Eastern Front, where 75,000 Italians had been killed and 50,000 repatriated with wounds, frostbite or disease, it was a complete catastrophe. His imperial dream was in tatters.
From their established positions on the North African coast, the Allies launched the invasion of Sicily on July the 10th. The invasion of Sicily. The first film to reach Britain shows the naval side of the operation. The equally thrilling story from the beaches onwards is on its way. This is just part of the mass of shipping plowing across the Mediterranean. Operation Husky put 115,000 British and Empire and 66,000 American troops ashore. They faced a garrison of 315,000 Italians and 50,000 Germans under General Alfredo Gruzzoni. Landing had been preceded by an airborne assault, which was a disaster. 69 gliders released too soon fell into the sea. 56 were released in the wrong places, only 12 landed as planned. The paratroopers fared as poorly, being dropped all over the island or into the sea. On the night of July 11th, 12th, the US 504th Parachute Regiment was flown from Tunisia to Sicily as reinforcement. 23 planes were destroyed and there were 400 casualties. All were victims of friendly fire. Despite these setbacks, forces with armor in support were established ashore in numbers. Alexander, Montgomery and Patton planning the elimination of the Germans from their strong defensive lines. On July the 16th, Patton began the drive on the Sicilian capital, Palermo, which he entered on the 23rd. On the 25th, Benito Mussolini, whose rise to power has been described by one historian as a process of creep and fudge, fell from power when he was arrested by the fascist Grand Council. On the 12th of September, he would be rescued from his imprisonment by a paratroop commando sent by Hitler, who set up his ally in a puppet state in the north of Italy, the Republic of Salo. It was there that Mussolini and Clara Petacci, his unfortunate mistress, were captured by partisans in January 1945. They were shot, mutilated, and hung up by their heels outside a Milan service station. Following Il Duce's arrest, the new government of Marshal Badoglio had entered into negotiations with the Allies. The armistice of Cassibile was signed on the 3rd of September. Italy was no longer at war. But the fighting in Italy was only just shifting into gear. The Allies had made a triumphant entry into the Sicilian port of Messina on August the 17th, but the enemy, along with 9,800 vehicles, had been evacuated to the Italian mainland. The Allies did not immediately pursue them. Instead, they squabbled for three weeks while the Germans moved 16 divisions onto the Italian peninsula. After Sicily was occupied, we were attacked by Germans. They would, at night, drop flares on the ships to light it up like you were on a stage. So the dive bombers would come in, and the Ju-88, they made a screech that would scare you. There were a couple of ships that were sunk, some with troops that didn't make it. Italy is a mountainous, river-scored, narrow country favoring defense and restricting the use of armor.
The campaign there was launched days after the armistice of Casabile on September the 9th, with landings south of Naples at a place called Salerno. The next day, the 10th Rome, which had been declared an open city, was occupied by German troops. September the 14th, two days after the rescue of Mussolini, German troops launched a fierce counterattack on the Salerno beachhead, which only Allied air and naval supremacy was able to beat back. We are to prevent the Germans from reinforcing the troops when the beach, when the landing took place, and to uh, keep it open for Clark's army to dash up towards Naples when they came through. The Germans came in force, and we opened fire on them, and the battle started. They quickly assessed that we didn't have very much in the way of weapons to fight them back. And the mortars started coming down. And they were on the higher ground than where we were. They gave us a very, very rough time. At one stage, they were that close to us. A German officer walked through with his map board, and he was shouting about some A company or something, and he passed not very far from me, until he was shot. But he didn't know where he was. He thought he was amongst his own people. So <laughs> that, that's how close they got. On September the 16th, the British 8th Army, advancing from the toe of Italy, linked up with the American 5th Army General Mark Clark. The Allies were strongly established in Italy and beginning their push towards Rome, but, as we shall see, their way ahead would be difficult in the extreme. At one time, I set my machine gun up. Right, there was a tree in there. It wasn't a big, giant tree, but it was a tree. And all of a sudden, a bullet comes through the tree, and when it exits, it was wood, it splatters me all across the face, and it knocked me back. They treated me, wanted to give me, put me up for a purple heart, and I said, oh, no, 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 I don't want that. I don't want my people to get no telegram, you know? Fighting was in its fourth year, and the initiative was swinging to Hitler's opponents, but all of his troops were still fighting on foreign soil. The great majority on the Eastern Front. Attention at the end of 1942 had been on Stalingrad, and whilst that city suffered the biggest battle in history, Another great Russian city continued to endure a devastating siege, Leningrad. The former imperial capital of St. Petersburg had been in a state of siege since the 8th of September, 1941. In January 1943, Operation Iskra was launched. The Leningrad and Volkov fronts succeeded in opening a land corridor that increased supply to the city. But it would not be until the 27th of January 1944, 872 days after it had begun, The siege was lifted and a trainload of cats to replace those that had been eaten was sent to deal with the rats. 
Half a million Axis soldiers were casualties, almost three and a half million Soviet troops, and a million Leningrad civilians had died at the rate of more than a thousand every day. The death toll at Leningrad alone was greater than the total combined British and American losses for the war. The Red Army's main effort as 1943 got underway would be centered on the Don, where the mighty battle for Stalingrad had concentrated such enormous forces. Since the beginning of January, Axis Army Group A had been falling back to a position behind the Lower Don. On the 13th, the Voronezh Front General Golikov began to move. Supported by the Bryansk Front, Golikov moved against the German Second Army. Soviet formations retook Rostov and Kursk, Pavlograd and Krasnograd. And then on February the 20th, von Manstein counterattacked. Putin's southwest front was driven back. Panzer forces broke through the Voronezh front and retook Kharkov. On the 18th of March, they had Belgograd and they reached the third stage of von Manstein's plan. The spring thaw briefly halted proceedings. The ebb and flow of the first part of the year had created a bulge in the Russian line, a salient. It was held by the Central and Voronezh fronts and based on Kursk. We came to the Voronezh district. The division was in the military district. First, it was a district district. Прямо в степи Воронежской образовали военный округ. Надо было несколько парамительных линий сделать. Вот. Мы готовились к Курской битве. Von Manstein planned for Walter Model's 9th Army to attack from the north and Hermann Holt's 4th Army with Group Wert to swing from the south. They would meet at Kursk. But pinching out the Kursk salient was an obvious option, and Stalin anticipated it. Hitler delayed the Kursk offensive, codenamed Citadel, scheduled for May the 4th. He had an increasingly passionate, possibly desperate belief that the war would be won by the wonder weapons and wanted more of the new heavy tanks sent to join the battle. His commanders knew that as they waited, the Soviets too were increasing their strength. Stalin's decision had been to stand on the defensive, and 300,000 mobilized Soviet citizens were preparing 9,000 kilometers of trenches in eight lines to a depth of 160 kilometers, and laying 503,993 anti-tank and 439,348 anti-personnel mines. What is generally recognized as the greatest tank battle in history opened on July the 4th. It was a huge coming together of armor. 900,000 German troops with 2,500 tanks faced 1,300,000 Russians with 3,000 tanks. Солнечный, жаркий, теплый день дали команду. Первая 
мы тогда жило нам шли в атаку. Как забила артиллерия, как засвистели это, а как за ракета летит, за ее можно наблюдать. Хвостиком она летит. A bombardment by air and artillery began the German offensive. Engineers moved forward at night to clear minefields. Страшно. Бомба свистит, она свистит не видно где. А как рвутся снаряды от минометов, они сильно миномет на огонь. Я уже не говорю, там автоматы, там пулеметы строчили. Пошел в атаку, его никогда нет, его нет. Я падаю, ползу назад, он лежит, смеется лежит. Глаза, а гляжу, а живота-то нет. Все вырвано, все наружу в него. Туман. И ничего не видно. Дым. И, и бомбят, и, и артиллерия, и тут и с танками. Команду не, не слышат. Я командую куда вправо, там влево, туда. Не слышат, мы ногами там это толкали их. Ты, 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 ты право, значит, лево. Ногой я с башней сижу, водитель, значит, говорю, куда надо. А бумажки, когда шли в атаку, положили адреса его себе, а мой ему, что, чтобы потом сообщить и передать это, полностью написано на бумажке. Что делать? Я, я пошел опять в ранение, тут же поднимаюсь. Неосторожность какая-то, перебежки. Винтовку уже я не могу. Бежит кровная, кровь потекла теплая по телу. Я лежу. Что делать дальше? Левая рука работает, винтовку держать не могу. Сам инструктор. Здоровая женщина. И тем более, я говорю, нет, не могу. А ползти могу. А винтовку она взяла. Мешок взяла мой вещевой. By the 7th of July, Model's forces in the north and Hoots in the south had made strong progress and seemed close to choking the neck of the salient. But progress slowed. Hoot was obliged to bring up his reserves on the 10th and on the 11th, Zhukov and Vasilevsky counterattacked. On the 12th, the Soviets brought their armored reserve to Prokhorovka. What followed was a massive clash of mechanized forces. Prokhorovskoy Poboyshki, the Russians call it, the slaughter at Prokhorovka. Бои были сложнейшие, очень тяжелые. Если, положим, вы успели как-то ворваться в эту линию обороны, за ней стояла третья линия обороны. То есть в одном месте были советские солдаты, рядом немецкие, за ними опять советские. Кто когда как успел врываться в окопы, И в рукопашную, кто когда так Бог кого выбивает. В мире мы много и травм, и всего, но слава Богу, что мы действительно все-таки смогли по-настоящему э, выполнить свои задачи вот, наступления на Курской э, дуе. 
недостаток наш был тем, что вот там был большой зазор такой вот. И вот эта вот была беда в этом, что откуда попадался, снаряд он задерживался там и разрывался. И меня, видимо, они заметили, подбили, значит, эту башню, вот где вращается. С этой вот башня летая была, летела, из литья. И они с пушкой, представляете, три с половиной тонны. Меня башню эту вырвала. Стрелок, который сидел рядом, и меня тоже вырвало. Контузия была такая сильная у меня. Seventy-five percent of the Red Army's armor and forty percent of its manpower was committed to the battle. Soviet losses in armor outnumbered those of the Axis by a ratio of five to one. The Russians also took more casualties. 177,847 against 49,822. But by now, only one side could rebound from such a contest. It was a very difficult time for us. Немецкие самолеты э, мистер Шмидта летали буквально 15-20 метров над землей. Значит, чувствую, что немцы летят, расстреливают. Даже слышишь, как э, пуль вспарывает землю, то впереди, то сзади. Кто-то кричит, кто-то уже не кричит и не может кричать, то есть убитый. In 1943, Soviet forces lost two million killed or missing and five and a half million wounded or sick. And yet, their strength grew during that time by half a million. Which is why Panzer General Heinz Guderian said that for Germany, Kursk was a decisive defeat. He described the events of 1943 as the revenge of reality. On July the 13th, Hitler called off Citadel. Reinforcements could not be spared. Area bombing had become a de facto second front, tying up 70% of the Luftwaffe's fighters, and the Allies were in Sicily. By July the 15th, the Central Front began to move. Two days later, the Southwest Front advanced, and by mid-August, the battle was over, the Russians were at the outskirts of Kharkov, and the last German offensive of the Eastern Front had come to nothing. I was lying without memory, without anything, without anything. This is the death of the shot. And the driver, who was in the car, and the shot was still there, who was with a bullet, and the guys were gone. I was there until now. I was there until now. Последние сколько раз это искал их, так не нашел, не знал их судьбу, погибли они или не погибли. Five weeks that followed Kursk, the Red Army forced the Germans back 240 kilometers on a thousand kilometer front. From now on, the Axis would be on the defensive, and it would defend all the way to Berlin. With winter about to freeze campaigning, the Russians could celebrate significant territorial gains. But the German armies were still intact, and they were still wholly on Soviet territory. But their falling fortunes had forced acceleration of one particular aspect of the plan for the East, the General Plan Ost.
uprisings at the Treblinka and Sobibor death camps and the Warsaw Ghetto, and the fact of the slowly but surely approaching Soviet troops created a sense of urgency. So the decision was taken to exterminate the Jews in the camps. At Maidenek in November, volunteers from German Reserve Police Battalion 101 working in shifts shot 43,000 Jews. They called it Operation Harvest Festival. A glorious page in our history, Himmler had said a month earlier, that cannot be written. We just could not imagine, we could not believe that this is possible. After all, this is Germany, the country of Goethe and Chile. Hmm? Alle Menschen würden Brüder, würde ein Senfer Flügelwald, eh? Brotherhood of Man, the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven, this is the poetry. These people could kill be innocent children. They could not imagine. Through 1943, the war in Europe grew increasingly to resemble a vice. The Axis powers caught between jaws that were slowly closing. But Asia was different, not just a different war, but a very different war. Asia was not a battleground of set-piece actions, but of scattered garrisons. Garrisoning the Pacific Islands was, according to the Imperial Vice Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Sukada Osamu, like sowing salt in the sea. In Asia, the only place where large all-arms formations clashed was in China. And in China, the only Allied troops supporting the Chinese against the Japanese were American General Joe Stilwell, who disrespectfully called Chiang Kai-shek the man he served, Peanut, few American engineers, and a unit of American flyers known as the Flying Tigers. They became the US 14th Air Force under Lieutenant General Claire Chenot. Chenot could not stand Stilwell, the feeling was mutual, as was the antagonism between Stilwell and Chiang Kai-shek. But if China stopped fighting, it would release 820,000 Japanese troops for other operations. Chiang Kai-shek not unreasonably felt that the contribution Chinese forces were making was not being appreciated and promises were not being kept. The feeling of inadequate appreciation of China's role in the war has not diminished. 30% of those who died in the Second World War were Chinese and 39% of Japan's casualties were taken in her fight with China. だけど、マンションね関係なかったんです。ただ部隊が段々いなくなってるの。南、南移動しやりちゃったから。シンガポール行くとか、あるいは台湾行くとか、フィリピン行くとか行って。なんでこんなに兵隊ばかり集めて南
where restoration of the Burma Road as a supply line to the nationalists was vital. Until it was accomplished, Chinese resistance to Japan depended on supplies being flown over the Himalayas. The Japanese supplied their troops through a railway that had been wrested from the landscape by slave labor and prisoners of war. Working on the 400-kilometer Burma-Thailand railway killed about 90,000 native slave laborers and 12,300 POWs. In total, 27% of Allied prisoners of the Japanese died in captivity. Those who were prisoners of the Germans had a death rate of 4%. The British Burma Army referred to itself as the Forgotten Army, but Lord Mountbatten said that it was not so much forgotten as never heard of. Mountbatten, despite responsibility for the disastrous Dieppe raid, continued to enjoy promotion far beyond his experience or perhaps capability. He was very well connected. One very interesting new appointment arising out of the Quebec conference is that of Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, the King's cousin. He's to be Supreme Commander-in-Chief, Southeast Asia. Lord Louis took up his position at headquarters in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, towards the end of 43, bringing with him a significant retinue that included his personal barber imported from Trumpers in Curzon Street and given the nominal rank of sergeant in the RAF. Batten would move on and up to be the last Viceroy of India presiding over its bloody transition to independence. The issue of Indian independence shadowed campaigning in Burma. Only a third of the British Army in the Far East was British. The bulk of the Burma Army comprised divisions of the Indian Army, which remained loyal to their officers and so to the Allied cause. Loyalty that was crucial to the success of the campaign in Burma. Dutiful consumption of war-issue anti-malarial tablets was also a key to victory. There was a time when up to 50, 60% of people were sick, malaria. But then they found a medicine in the UK, their scientists. Mephocrit, little tablet. Every evening, the parade will take place. Everybody is given a tablet. And when you, Havaldar says, up, you see it. And then he said, down. In the Pacific, the Japanese task was to hold on to gains. This they failed to do. In the first half of 1943, the main Allied target was Rabaul. Admiral Halsey was placed in command. American and Australian forces kept up the pressure on Japanese strongholds in Leh and Salamua, which would have to be reduced before Rabaul could be attacked. I thought it was great to go out and watch the Japanese uh, planes come over, and they would turn upside down to see if they could, what they could see on the, on the ground. 
America sought to disrupt Japanese attempts to supply and reinforce. In the Battle of the Bismarck Sea at the beginning of March, American aircraft coming in at low level surprised a convoy. It was transporting an entire division to reinforce Ley and Salamua. All eight transports were sent to the bottom, along with four of the accompanying destroyers. As September started, Australian and American troops made amphibious landings at Ley. The Japanese evacuated Salamua. The Australians faced fierce resistance at Finchhaven, which fell to them on the 2nd of October. At the end of August, Imperial Japanese headquarters, unable to guarantee supply, declared that henceforth, New Guinea would have to be self-sufficient. Holes were being punched in the defensive perimeter of the co-prosperity sphere. The Allies had achieved control of the sea and of the skies throughout the perimeter of the sphere, extending air cover by the development of airfields as they leapfrogged from island to atoll to island. Ahead lay Saipan, Guam, and the Philippines. What the Allies achieved involved action over vast distances, taking a well-armed and equipped force over thousands of kilometers of ocean. It was only possible because of the astonishing achievements of American production, organization, and control. Each American frontline soldier was supported in the Pacific by four tons of supplies. Each Japanese by a single kilogram. Each Japanese was supported by one person in a non-combat role. The American tail, engineers, medical, transport, quartermaster, catering, numbered 18 in support of each combat soldier. The odds building against the Japanese can be simply expressed. Between 1940 and 1943, Japan's gross national product rose by two points, that of the USA, which increased industrial production 25-fold during the war, increased by 136 points. In the next episode of The Price of Empire, it is 1944, a year of great offensives. The march towards the Philippines in the Pacific, Operation Migration on the Eastern Front, the battle for Italy, and the greatest amphibious landing in history that opened the Second Front against Hitler, Operation Overlord. <laughs>